Hey guys, how are you? I am super excited tonight. And if, whether you are watching live or you watch this later on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram TV, or you're listening to the podcast, um, I'm super stoked about the conversation that's going to happen um, and what we're going to be able to explore because it's not something that I've really considered. I think it's something that I've mentioned sometimes in passing, but being able to talk to someone who really gets it and um, walks the walk, I think is going to be really exciting. So I want to introduce you guys to Nate Green and Nate, I'm going to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and then we'll just dive right in because we have lots to talk about. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Nate Green, I am a technology and instruction coach at Flint Hill School, which is a private school in uh, Oakton, Virginia, outside Washington, D.C. Uh, and I was a history teacher for a number of years and just mo moved over into the uh, ed tech side. Uh, a couple of years ago. And I met Andy at the TCEA conference um, in Austin, which was really fun. And uh, we immediately hit it off talking about uh, our mutual interests, which I, I would always use the term uh, passion-based learning. Uh, and she uh, immediately was like, yeah, that's me. Let's talk. And um, <laughs> you know, the, re the rest is history. Here, here I am on this podcast, uh, excited to talk about that exact topic. Yeah, I, so true. When I when we were able to connect at TCEA and I was actually able to go to your session that you delivered um, all about leveraging social media. And that's really something I've been really interested in is what does that look like with passion based learning and social media? What role does social media play in that? And so just getting to sit in your session and learn from you was awesome. And so I thought, oh, my gosh, I have to bring that to the Meaningful Mess community and let them kind of hear what this looks like, sounds like, feels like. and Hearing it from an educator who's actually doing in the doing it in the classroom, I think, is really powerful. Yeah, oh, certainly. I mean, I so much of my talks come from my students, and I actually just, I feel like when you're talking about social media, especially with my age group, high schoolers, um, you have to be in touch with what they're doing online. You have to be talking to them all the time to keep up. Uh, so uh, it's it's definitely important that, that I'm you know in, in schools and in, in the classroom, and I feel lucky to have a class. Um, that I call passion-based learning through social media, where we do get to explore, um, the students get to explore their own passions and, and I help them do that on social media. And uh, the idea came about actually from sort of the connection that we're making now. Uh, when, I, when I first entered education as a, as a history teacher, um, I fell in love with SS chat and ed, ed tech and those, those hashtags. Mm -hmm. I learned so much from all these different educators. And I found that for me, social media was a place that I could get good at my passion. Uh, which was, was teaching and I sort of had a, a really simple thought on this. I was like, well, if I can do that on social media, why can't my students? Um, so I, I set out to, to put that to the test and, and see if that could happen. Um, it's funny because I didn't, I didn't necessarily think of it as, as genius hour, but then in talking to you at this conference, I was like, oh, <laughs> surely this is exactly what genius hour is. Um, and again, I, I took it from sort of small time working it in sort of genius hours and in projects and as a club and sort of over time, I evolved it to eventually get this class where literally my students get to choose a passion of theirs. And then I teach them how to learn about that through social media, uh, where they're first they're learning online and curating cool stuff from networks of you know uh, mm -hmm. experts and professional organizations that are putting out quality content about whatever their passion may be. And then eventually start contributing to that and collaborating with people in that. Uh, and so I, I developed this this from from scratch, but it came from what all of us who are watching this or listening to this podcast do all the time, which is just network with other educators on social media. Yeah, I think it's so funny. I remember when we met at TCEA and we started having that conversation, you were like, here's my framework for passion-based learning. And I was like, oh, here's my framework for passion-based learning. And so I was able to show you the six Ps and you showed me kind of your framework. And it's so funny just that like-mindedness and how so many of us are doing similar things and have similar ideas. Um, and I just think that power of networking and getting together and collaborating is super powerful. Um, so that being said, I, one of the things that I often say about social media is it's not going anywhere. Like it's here to stay so we can pretend it doesn't exist all we want. But the reality is our students are using it from a very young age and pretending that it doesn't exist. is not going to solve any of the problems I don't think that we have right now um, with social media. So with that being said, I just want to start with the first question. I wrote these down. So I'm legit reading from a script here, which I never do. But I want to make sure that we get all the questions in. Um, 
So social media in the classroom can be a really scary idea. I know that from the educators that I talk to, whether they're elementary, middle school or high school, um, so often it's scary to even think about using social media in the classroom. So where do you suggest that educators start as they kind of embrace this idea of leveraging social media in the classroom? Ooh, uh, where do I start? Um, to your, to your, to the framing of your question, it's our kids are using it all the time, um, and in so many different ways that it seems foolish for us to ignore it in schools. But at the same time, it's easiest to ignore it in schools because you don't, uh, uh, teachers and administrators don't want to get into student space for fear of what they might find, um, mm -hmm. and so it's easier just to shut it out. Uh, and I don't think that's going to work. And and, and uh, the sort of long answer to this is if we're graduating kids into a world where they come to know and learn in social media, and yet we don't mm -hmm. teach them how to use social media, we're allowing them to know and learn without any instruction or mentorship from us. And I think that's malpractice. Um, so that's uh, the philosophical, <laughs> the philosophical version of like, yeah, we have to. Uh, and then more, more concretely to your question about um, teachers is I, I think, uh, let me start it by saying, I, I started my presentation with this activity where I talk about some of the things that teenagers do and say in social media spaces. And uh, I purposely make it really challenging. And I put things on there that educators are like, oh, I, don't, I don't know what any of this stuff is. Uh, and I did it on purpose. Then I said, listen, you don't have to know any of this stuff, like nothing about this. Um, you don't need to know what um, Twitch is or TikTok or and, you know, anything like that um, to make a real impact here. And it's because what we do every day as teachers is we ask and mentor our kids to come into our classes, wanting to learn and be a good citizen and, and collaborator and classmate. And, and, and at the end of the day, just a good person. Um, and if that is how you feel about your kids and how they come in your classroom, if you just do that same thing with how they're online and how they're using social media, you are going to do a great job, whether you know what these things are or, or you don't. Um, right. So I, I'm trying to set a really low bar uh, to say <laughs> that like anything you do in there is amazing because you're an adult and you're a role model um, and, and you're looking out for their best interests. So anything uh, is, is my answer to that question. Anything you can do is going to help. I like that. And I loved when you started your session at TCEA and you were talking about those things that um, you just did exactly what you just said and put up that slide of, do you know what these things are? And I think it's so interesting because so often I think as educators, we feel intimidated if we don't know what they are. So, well, we're intimidated by social media, so we're just not going to talk about it or we're intimidated by this technology tool. So we're not going to use it. Um, I think that's the space in which we can learn from our students. Like that's really where we can engage with them and ask questions. And man, they're willing to talk about social media for sure. Anytime we can connect that to the content, I feel like it's kind of game on for them. Um, okay, so next question. This was one of the things that I love that you shared at TCEA. You shared this really practical idea related to the additional reading portion of a syllabus. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. I'd love for the Meaningful Mess community to kind of hear what that looks like because I thought it was something you could do tomorrow in your classroom. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's the challenge for a speaker at these sessions is give, give us something we can do. Um, right. So the way, I, the way I frame it, as I said, I, you know, when I was in college, I took a lot of classes with professors that would say, you know, we're crunched for time. And so here's the readings we're going to do and here are the things we're going to do in class. But if you really like this class, here's like three or four more books or articles or whatever that are somewhat related that are close that would, that is worth reading, but we just, just cut for time. And mm -hmm. so I took that exact concept and I, I had this experience where I was like, well, for most of my classes, I, that meant nothing to me. I did not read any of that. I threw that in the trash. Right. But for the classes I really <laughs> loved, I found that I was like, Oh, this, you know what? My professor recommended this book. I, I actually want to read it, you know? And, and I had this thought where I was like, well, what is the version of that? Um, for the 21st century, for what we're doing now. Um, and I think for us, we have a, a that we have that opportunity on steroids because what we can tell our kids is, here's an additional, uh, additional reading section of my syllabus, only it's all of the experts in my um, subject matter and all of these amazing professional organizations that, that put out awesome stuff in this subject matter. And mm -hmm. when you follow that stuff on social media, 
the it is a bottomless feed and it updates in real time with what's going on in the world. And therefore, a student who graduates from my class never has to stop learning about what's going on in that subject area. So whether you're teaching, you know, history or English or science or, or what have you, like you can curate a list of the, um, uh, you know, the authors of your textbooks or your readings, um, the, the YouTube creators, or, or the, even the teachers that teach your class that put out amazing flip videos on YouTube and, um, you know, the organizations that are connected to your interest. So if I was teaching history, something like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or any, you know, anything like that, that, that is sort of mm -hmm. connected, can end up building a list for our students so they can learn indefinitely about this subject matter. Um, and I've been doing that for a number of years in a number of my different, a number of different classes. Uh, and I have students who come up to me after the fact that say, you know, it was for, for instance, one of my history classes was called Contemporary World History. And one of my students came up to me two years later and was like, I still open the Twitter account that you made and go to that list when That's there's awesome. breaking news in world events. And I'm like, well, wow. there you go. You don't need me to continue to learn about this. If you really like this, you know, run with it. You, you don't, you know, you're not limited by my syllabus. You're not limited by my reading for our time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. But, I think that makes so much sense to give them that additional because so often they want to learn more. They just aren't always sure. And the, the role that social media plays in that because it's always, you know, the online access that they have is always growing and changing. And so there's never there's never that they can always be learning like that whole lifelong learning piece, I think is I, there. I, sh I probably should have mentioned that's also meeting them in the space where they are like telling you to go mm -hmm. buy an extra book to read something like maybe, but like telling them like, <laughs> Oh, you're already using Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. And what are you already, mm -hmm. you have an email account, like just subscribe to these newsletters, just add these feeds. So it's also reaching them in a place where we are likely to get them um, to do this thing uh, rather than on a piece of paper that's given out on the first day and never looked at again. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I think that's important to know what your kids are using, like asking them what social media accounts do you have and what are you using and um, understanding how they use those and just really talk. I remember the first time I ever heard Don Wetrick, we were saying earlier, we both know him and have done some work with him. Um, I remember the first time I ever heard him talk about social media being that place to positively promote themselves. And just that kind of light bulb went off for me of, you know, so often I had talked about digital citizenship, which is so important, but I had always spoken from it. I had always spoken about it from the perspective of what they shouldn't do. Like, don't do this, don't do this instead of what they can do. And and one of those things is to promote themselves positively. And um, one of my friends, Mary Alice, who runs um, the Digital Citizenship Institute, I think you know her as well, or you've met her. I met her right uh, now, I met you. Yeah, so yeah. She's, you can't miss her. She's so much fun. Um, I absolutely love her. And that's one of the things she always says about digital citizenship is to stop telling them what they can't do and start telling them what they can do, because that power is huge for sure. Um, OK, so so often we ask today's learners to consume. And so I think as we have this conversation about using social media to leverage lifelong learning, um, what it, what role does this play in helping students actually produce? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and since we sort of started talking about how to learn online, especially in the answer to that last question, and I think your segue talking about Don Wetrick and, and um, everyone personal branding. And I think he, he had a guest that called, I don't remember who it was, who said everyone's a media company. Um, mm. And actually, just before before we sort of get into creating online, it's important to note that our students are really, really, really good at this. Like they have three or four different personas on three or four different apps and they're fluent mm. in all of the different intricacies and nuances of those apps that can make them be a certain thing and get props for a certain thing and get respect or get looked at in a certain way based on how they use it. It's unbelievable how good they are at this. Um, and yet, um, to, to your point, to Don's point, uh, they're not using it in a way that we would sort of identify as professional. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's where we end up in, I, I don't know, that, I, guess, I would say that's a little bit where, where Don and I may differ because Don believes that, and, you know, I hate to put words in someone's mouth, but he's saying, well, everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. They need to have their own brand. They need to have their own business. Um, wh whereas I think, I would stick more on the side of the genius hour, passion-based learning hour, the learning idea, which is you just have to have something you really care about where you mm -hmm. are understood as someone who's learning about that thing. And in order to be understood as someone who's learning about that passion, you have to create and contribute. Um, so I just see it as a logical next step. Again, they're already doing that, um, but can we, can we redirect it in a way that's connected to a passion that's 
um, delivering content from experts and professional organizations with role models like us helping them with that. And then logically the, the next step is, well, what can you contribute to that space so you can be understood as that? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, for me and, and for, for your six Ps, I'm sure it's similar. Like I'm asking them to create, share and collaborate. Um, and it's absolutely mm -hmm. essential to do that. Um, and so I don't care if you're in kindergarten or 12th grade or, or in college, like you can send a message to someone on Twitter and they just hit you back. It's, it's right. just so, it's so, it's such an amazing space. Um, so the concept of collaborating is actually available to everyone, uh, mm -hmm. which is just so powerful. Um, but again, you know, if you're going to be successful collaborating, you have to first create, right? There's these sort of, th there's these steps that you have to sort of take um, mm -hmm. that, Again, they're doing anyway. They just need our sort of mentorship guidance, uh, role modeling to sort of steer them in the right direction. And and then just this final point on this is like, I just fundamentally believe that that cannot happen in social media spaces for our kids if they are not actively interested and passionate about the thing that they are learning and creating and sharing about. And that's the key for us as as adults is to help them find that and and nurture that. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that 100%, especially because just I've seen that power in my own classroom of when you let passion drive the learning. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's a game changer for sure. And I think those of us that have experienced it, like we are able to it makes sense to us. But sometimes when you're seeing it from the outside, understanding what that looks like, this sounds so foreign, like what using social media in my classroom? That's a terrible idea. But when you've seen it happen and you've seen your students shift from seeing social media as a space where they can, you know, I always think about kids who are really unfortunately ruining their lives on social media. So whether it be them saying inappropriate things or posting things they shouldn't be posting, um, thinking through, you know, when I remember the first time we tweeted something out, my two of my students had made a dog collar. Uh, these were elementary kids and they were super proud of it. And we tweeted it out and we had actually tagged some big name pet companies in the tweet. And those companies liked it. And when they liked our tweet, that was a big aha moment for my kids because they were like, wait, what? They saw that? Like they saw what we created. And so they got to realize that whole authentic audience piece and that, oh my gosh, this is for real. And people see what we put out there. And it's an opportunity to do exactly what we were talking about, that positive promotion for sure. I knew I was setting you up perfectly with that, Andy. Because <laughs> You I, did. I, I, this is a genius hour, perfect, perfect setup. And I think I actually, if, I, if I were to turn this interview around, which I I don't want to do to you, but I think there's, the way that I sell sort of the importance of using social media in the class is similar to how you sell why we need to have Genius Hour, why we need to have mm -hmm. some space for these kids to pursue passions. I think I think it's it, it's very similar, um, and, and I'm I'm glad we're finding ways to do it. And and to your to your students that had the, this recognition, I mean, when they first see the power of that, it changes everything. And it does. For our kids, for the kids I'm talking about, that I'm trying to get them to find something they like and start to contribute to that space. Um, when they all of a sudden understand themselves as a learner and sharing and, and collaborator in, in that space, it starts to make them rethink about how they use social media and what digital citizenship is and what media literacy is. And so a lot of the things that we're trying to teach in schools anyway that we, we think are really, really important, um, I, I think we can't really solve them without getting involved in social media and without showing our kids the way in that space. Because if we take it mm -hmm. offline, it does, it's meaningless to them. Um, but once we get it into that space, it, it changes the entire game. Uh, and again, no matter what age you are, which I think is it's so powerful. And, if, and, and given that power, we got to get in there and get working. Right. And I think one of the conversations that is often had around social media is just that whole, you know, well, how old should they be or when they, when can they start learning this? And, and I think that's important. And I think that's up to the parents. And I think it's up to where they want to start and what that looks like. But the reality is at some point they're going to have access whether it's now or later, they're going to get their hands on social media at some point. And so my perspective is just the earlier we can introduce them to just the power of that and and the um, not not always the negatives, but the positives. I think I think there's really something there for sure. Yeah, um, and if I could if I could link that to, to the to the buzzwords, which is what I was trying to do, that digital citizenship, media literacy, and digital portfolios are yeah. these buzzwords that we're trying to teach. And what we what you and I just described is all of them. It's like 
your digital citizenship would be getting, in my my definition, getting online as an active, informed citizen. If you're, you know, sharing, if you're learning about something you care about with other experts and professional organizations, that would that works, right? And media liter media literacy, like to me, one way to define that is what network you're in and who you're learning from. And if you're learning from experts and professional organizations, like you're you become pretty media literate. And then digital portfolios would be like, well, what is your digital footprint? What do you look like online? And how carefully curated is it? That it can you know open doors for you later in life and if they're branding you know uh, uh, as you said earlier if they're contributing and collaborating like all of a sudden we just knocked out all three of these buzzwords and we did it in the space that they are anyway um yeah and it's and it's we we stop worrying about the don'ts as you talked about earlier we don't have to be like hey don't do this because now they know that they're like yeah no i'm i'm making this dog collar and selling it online like of course i'm not going to like call my friend an idiot like you know like they, they, right. start to, they start to pick this up when they see sort of the the top the ceiling what they can do with it and so the sooner to your point the sooner we can get them there the better um and then also to your point they're there anyway so you know it, it, rather than making this a nightmare let, let's show them how it's done and and uh you know, it, then we'll start to see less of the reactive, oh, this kid posted that, or mm -hmm. reactive, that's a really bad source you use on your essay. You know, we, we can start to knock some of that off if we if we uh, shoot, aim, aim higher, you know? Right, and it's more authentic. I think yeah. when things are authentic and organic, that's when real learning happens. It's not when we tell them you shouldn't do this. They just hear, you know, it's like Charlie Brown's teacher, right? Womp, womp, womp. They don't hear it. But if they can experience it in an authentic and a real way, powerful i feel like i think that's when real deep learning happens is when it comes from that place of, of really being organic um okay so we kind of talked about this already but i want to see if there's anything you want to add to it so thinking about passion-based learning and um genius hour whatever you want to call it 20 percent time what specific role do you feel like apart from outside experts and what we just talked about does social media play in that yeah i think sort of what we were saying earlier is if if you have a kid that's truly passionate about something or is using his or her 20% time a certain way, um, why wouldn't we take advantage of where they're spending the other 80% of their time with, you know, with social media? So uh, we, we might as well take what's, a, what's available to us to help them, you know, genius hour, 20% time. Uh, and that would, that would be social media. I, th I think in my talk sometimes, I don't, I like to say that like, it would be, I think I'd be happy to know that our kids were spending a little less time online. They were more face-to-face -face conversations. Mm -hmm. They spent more time outside. Like, I think just like in my heart of hearts, like that would be great. But I'm operating from the numbers. And the numbers are that teens and tweens spend tons of time consuming digital media. It's like seven hours from Common Sense Media's mm -hmm. estimation. Um, and so if so much of that time is gonna be in that space and we want to have genius time, we want them to develop passions, we have to merge those two to if we want to make that successful. Um, so I, I don't think we have a choice. And then coming back to something I said way back at the beginning is, um, if we're going to let them navigate those spaces without us, we're not. They're not going to use it for what they would otherwise use their genius time for. They're going to use it much more socially, much more like entertainment e, mm -hmm. um, and much more passively, much more consuming rather you know rather than create rather than active, right? And so. Uh, it just does wonders when you when you can turn twenty percent time into much more than that when you're engaging them in spaces where they're going to be anyway, but you're showing them a way to you know to follow a passion. So I, I think it's an I think it's a no brainer. I do realize it's tough, and I, I know you started with that with that question, but um, you know we, we got to get there. And, and there are little ways, you know, from from the syllabus project that from that I said to your your dog collar project. Uh, yeah. Uh, whether it's the, the the list that I made for my history kids, or it's my kids building their own networks in my class to a class running their own account, um, to a class having their own blog. You know, there's a ton of ways to get involved in this. Um, and I want all of the above everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, so, so many times, whether it's a podcast or a live video, these new things, these innovative ideas that we're talking about, certainly weaving social media into the classroom is a new idea and something that um, we're having to talk about because of who this generation is and how they operate. Um, and so thinking about that, I always like to say like, nobody is suggesting that this is easy and that it doesn't uh, need to involve conversation with parents, admin, all of that stuff has to happen and a real understanding of why it's a priority in the classroom and why you're weaving it into the learning, I think is something that um, 
is really, really important as well. Um, one of the things that I want to mention that I haven't mentioned yet is I want you to talk a little bit about the website that you created, what it is, what it looks like, and how students can use it. I, sh I should be better at plugging my own website. Um, you totally should be better at that. Uh, so um, in this, this class that I've been talking about called Passion-Based Learning Through Social Media, I have these students that say, I'm interested in this or that or, or what have you. I'm interested in law or politics or technology or, I don't know, Mr. Green, but I like my science class. So I developed this website that's called, um, that's socialmediamarketplace.org. And you click something you're interested in and it will spit back to you feeds to follow, newsletters to subscribe to, YouTube channels to uh, subscribe to, uh, Instagram, whatever, Facebook, Twitter, all that, all that kind of stuff. And um, it's a way for you to build up your personalized learning network, um, much like how we are all participating in our personalized learning networks to, to get better at teaching or, or Genius Hour or whatever, whatever, whatever brings you to Meaningful Mess podcast. Um, yeah. So yeah. That, that's the goal. That's the goal of the website. And it's really, it, you're looking at it. It's a one man operation. And I, I try my best to, to make some, some meaningful recommendations on those topics, but it's really challenging. And I think more the, that what they you know, the takeaway that I like to give to my, my audiences, my conference audiences on this podcast would be that you should go through that same sort of process. Um, you know, and actually the sort of the biggest way that I think this makes an impact when I say it is I think parents, they know their, their kids the best and what they're interested in. And so they're often the audience I, I reach the, the best because they're like, well, oh, I know my kid loves you know, photography, but I never really thought about helping him or her use social media to get better at photography. Um, mm -hmm. And so often they have that sort of student interest, they already know it, uh, but they don't know how to build that personalized learning network the way we do, because we've all, we've all done it. Um, so just getting the students started on that whether it's a, 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 a advisor, teacher, role model helping a, a student do that, or a parent helping a child do that, um, you know, that's the first step to building a network, a, a network of quality information that will help you mm -hmm. develop in an area of interest. So socialmediamarketplace.org is, is a place to get started for that, and it's it's what I use for my class to get my kids off the ground. But by the time they leave my class, they have you know they're following seventy to hundred things, and and I don't know what they all are. That they're, they're things they pick up over the semester. That's awesome. I, I just love that they leave your class with that understanding of how to build a network because networking is, so, I mean, if we weren't, if we didn't know how to network, we would have never met, never made this connection yeah. and this would have never happened. Um, so I think that those, that networking feeling of, you know, meeting people, understanding what it's like to um, really collaborate with somebody who's like-minded and to be able to do amazing things from that, that doesn't have to happen in your 30s and 40s. Like, man, I wish I would have known how to do this when I was in college, or I wish I would have known this when I was in high school. And having a senior now, I think I really see the power of, you know, them needing to know what they're passionate about before they graduate. I don't know why we want to wait until they graduate for kids to figure out what they're interested in or passionate about. Um, and I'm sure you see that with your learners as well. Yeah, it, it, can I jump in that real quick? I, yeah, I think that's, I love that's for you such, is such an important point. And Okay, so my, I, you know, I get, get 16, 18 kids in this class and, and they graduate in the semester. Many of them, most of them put their passion down. They stop updating their blog or their YouTube channel or whatever it is they built, whatever content they're contributing. Um, and, and that should, that's like, should deter me or dissuade me or make me disenchanted with my own idea. But it's it, quite, quite the contrary because I know that when maybe this wasn't their passion, maybe they didn't have the time for it, whatever reason they, mm -hmm. they put this aside. I mean, mostly it's time <laughs> um, right. because they have other classes, they have other responsibilities, they're on sports teams, they, they're doing art, whatever. Um, so for, for me, I know that once they figure out, they're like, oh, you know what? I really want to get good at this. They mm -hmm. have the process down. They know where to go. They know how to build a network. They know how to contribute to that network. They know what it means to brand themselves and to be a part of that network. And I've seen some of my kids, now that I've been doing it long enough, which is key, I've seen some of my kids take my class and do one thing and then come back around after they're in college and be like, I'm majoring in this and now I have this network and now I collaborate with these people and do this. And I'm like, you've done it, you know? Awesome. Um, so yeah. I, I, ha I just have to believe that we're actually just giving them the skills for something they're gonna do later. And to your point, Andy, why would we wait till they're 22 or 28 or, you know, out of high school, out of college, out of grad school before they start to build a, a professional network and brand themselves professionally? Um, yeah. That's beyond me. And, and if I can end with a positive it's note. It's beyond me as well. <laughs> um, it's beyond me. And, and I think uh, I like to talk about this in, in 
and I'll, I'll let your, your podcast audience chew on this one. I think that the best example of this, albeit it is an extreme and it's actually like not on good circumstances, is if you think about the success of someone like David Hogg or the Parkland kids, again, mm -hmm. dramatic, awful circumstances, but mm -hmm. they found a passion in, in the worst of ways and they took it and they ran with it and they did unbelievable work. You know, mm -hmm. that he, he in particular tweeted out his college rejections Mm. And, you know, I was like, why would colleges reject this? Dude, he, he wrote a book. He's, he, he, he made a million, per, he was a leader of a million person march. Like wow. he, he, he was on these podcasts. He was, he was, you know, holding himself on MSNBC or CNN every other night. Like, you know, he was just unbelievable. And he was getting rejected from colleges. And sure enough, he, wow. he deferred a year. And the next year, Harvard was like, please come study at Harvard. Yeah. And so uh, that's not for everyone, obviously. And the other mm -hmm. one's Greta Thunberg. From, from who's like you know doing the climate um, uh, mm -hmm. activism, uh, she we had the, the worst kind of trolls attacking her online for her work, and she claps back like it's nothing, and is, yeah. is building a movement and leading like nothing nothing we've ever seen. So mm -hmm. if we can just you know genius hour passion based learning, if we can just pique their interest, um, social media is just gives them this unbelievable space to do truly amazing things. Uh, and yeah. I know those are anomalies and those are extremes. I get that, but that's the bar. That's how high it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at this point in schools, we haven't even left the starting gate. You know, um, some of us have yeah. us as teachers and, and especially at like, you know, at ed tech conferences, I, I find other people that are doing this, but schools in general and teachers in general are, are still, are still uh, waiting to get started on this. And I, 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 when I, when I use examples like that, I can't figure out why. And to your point, Andy, if you have a, if you have a child, um, you've sort of seen this from the other side of it, of how they use their time on their phone and their computer and, and what they could be doing with their time in those spaces. Right. Um, it, it seems like it's just a gigantic missed opportunity and a generation um, that, that, that where they're, uh, you know, they're being left to figure this out on their own. And, and, and it seems like that's what they want, but mm -hmm. that has not been my experience. And I think that's something you were hinting at earlier when you're talking about how often when you want to talk to kids about social media, they want to talk about it. Um, they definitely want this instruction and we got it. We got to get it to them. Yes. I love that. And that's such a great way to kind of wrap things up. I think bringing it back to that whole, it really is a fear. I mean, I really think that's what it boils down to is the fear of what if we don't know, or what if they know more than us? Okay. Spoiler alert. They do. <laughs> they do know more than us um, as far as social media and some of the technology. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's the whole idea behind lifelong learners. If we're really going to send that message of the importance of lifelong learners, we have to model that and we have to show that we're willing to learn as well. And sometimes that has to happen from our students. So I love that. I think that was a great way to kind of wrap this up. As we do that, I want to make sure that you have time to um, tell the audience how they can connect and learn from you, because I think there's so many people that are going to hear this and they may not be willing to full on jump into social media in the classroom. It may still be a little scary, but they might want to dip their toe in the water or they might want to kind of just think about some of the practical things you shared and how they could do that in their classroom so that they're at least starting the conversation. So will you just share how they can connect with you and continue to learn? Um, sure. as well. anyone, anyone who's thinking about it, come on in. I want to help you. <laughs> I want to talk to you. Andy and I connected at this conference and I was sort of sad. I'm like, where are the social media people at this conference? Right. Um, and, and I found some, of course, I always do, but I'm always looking for more. Um, so uh, my Twitter handle is at Mr. Shakedown, MR Shakedown. And my website is socialmediamarketplace.org. That's where I built this, this resource for my students. I also blog at um, socialmeded.blogspot.com. You can catch this through my Twitter. Um, you know, please tweet me, um, DM me, email me. I would love to talk to you about where you are and what you're doing and what you need. Um, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about this. And um, any chance I get to talk to others that are um, joining um, in this movement, uh, I'm in. I, I really think, I said this to Andy at the conference, I really think we're there are some communities, there are great communities in education, and there's just not one for social media yet. Um, so right. so let's, let's build that. By all means, uh, hit me up. Let's, let's talk and let's, let's build a little movement here because we need it. 
I love it. Well, thank you so much for taking time to be on whether I don't know how they're watching this or how they're listening to it. But I am so glad that the Meaningful Mess community had the opportunity to kind of think about this and dive in and think about social media and how it can be used to leverage that lifetime learning. So thank you again so much. You guys make sure that you connect with Nate on Twitter at the very least so that you have connections to all of the other ways you can connect with him as well. So thank you. Thank you. And I will talk to you soon. Bye, guys.